plan for you for the third and final day of the 7th SNF Conference on Philanthropy. And before we begin, we would like to share with you a video that we have made to show you what philanthropy means for us. Don't ask what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Don't ask what others can do for you, but what you can do for others. For our families, our friends, our colleagues, our communities, ourselves. And this is what we are. A multitude of individuals working together each tested by time and circumstance, but strong in our will to persist, to learn, to grow, to connect, to strive. Sharing is not forfeiting, because united, we can achieve anything. We work around the globe as a team. More than 4,000 grants, two and a half billion dollars in grant commitments in over 120 countries. We read and engage with thousands of new ideas. We travel thousands of miles each year, from the Aegean to the Middle East, from Africa to Asia to the United States. We listen. We try to find solutions together to build a future in which all may flourish. We celebrate humanity with our similarities and our differences. We focus on saying yes instead of saying no, because we believe that together, with open minds and welcoming hearts, we can create great things. We believe that everyone should have access to education and healthcare. Everyone should be able to sing and dance and play all should pursue their dreams. This is philanthropy, caring about each other, loving all of mankind.
stage the SNF's co-president, Mr. Andreas Drakopoulos. Kalimera. Uh, before I introduce uh, Dr. Tim Shriver and talk a bit about a collaboration about the Special Olympics project, Given that it's the start of the third and final day of the conference, I wanted to speak about next year's dates, which is uh, June 23rd to June 30th. It's the whole week, Sunday to Sunday. So the conference will be two or three days starting that Monday. And the June 23rd is always part of our, of our week uh, because it's the day, the Olympic day, and it's the day that we do the run. And by the way, I hope that a lot of you will actually participate it's a beautiful run this evening. The, we're going to be asking for your input. Uh, I un understand that from the URL that you already have in the, in the package and through which you, you ask questions at the panels, there is a, a format that you can send an evaluation form. So we would really appreciate to hear from you openly what you think works and what you think doesn't work. And, uh, we have thick skin, so say whatever you want. Or if you want to send a, a, an email, it would, it would really help us uh, for next year. Uh, we know we have to improve a few things, uh, and although it's, it's still happening, I think we have to do uh, more about, uh, about diversity uh, and also more, more people uh, from the whole world outside of the U.S. Uh, so we work, we're going to work on that. And also the other thing was that we are trying to engage the audience as much as we can, and we'll try to find ways to improve on that. But if you have any thoughts, please feel free uh, through either the, the evaluation format or simply by emails to really let us know what you think we could do to improve the format or the substance. And talking about the substance, usually we already know from the year before what the, what the theme is gonna be for next year. This year we don't. So again, in the same format or email, if you have any, any themes that you think will be interesting and important, we would love to hear from you. And we will let you know, uh, you know in the next two or three months what the theme is gonna be for next year. Uh, and again, we're very thankful to all the participants, all the panelists, and everyone who has been here with us all these three days. And a special thanks to all my colleagues who put all this in place. Sometimes it looks smooth, but there's a lot of work, as I just said at the opening day. So thank you. I won't name them because there are, there are many, but uh, thank them all uh, for all, all the good work. So uh, again, good morning. Welcome to the third and closing day of the seventh annual Stavros Nyakos Foundation International Conference on Philanthropy. It is with great pleasure that I would like to introduce this morning Dr. Timothy Schreiber, the chairman of Special Olympics International, Dr. Shriver is a leading educator whose work has focused, among other things, on establishing groundbreaking practices of understanding and engaging with individuals with intellectual disabilities. Special Olympics International has established presence in over 170 countries, engaging and working together with more than 5 million Special Olympics athletes. One of the organization's pioneering program is Play Unified, Learn Unified. The fundamental premise of the program is to promote integration, inclusiveness, and understanding through school-based sports programs that bring, that, that bring together on the same team students with and without intellectual disabilities. It is all about creating a unified generation. The program has been implemented successfully in the U.S. and, and has been rolled out in, in many countries around the world. Given the program's demonstrated ability to actually transform schools into spaces of in inclusiveness, we are proud and delighted to have announced yesterday a new major initiative in collaboration with Special Olympics in International. 
over a period of three years and through a major grant of $10 million, the Stavros Nyakos Foundation will partner with Special Olympics International to expand the Unified Sports and Unified Schools program to 19 countries worldwide, among others including Brazil, Chile, China, Egypt, India, Kenya, Tanzania, Morocco, Greece, and others. The initiative will aim to create approximately 2,000 new unified schools, to train over 20,000 new unified sports coaches, and to engage over 750,000 athletes and unified partners. In addition to, to the above, the initiative will also aim to offer over 300 innovation grants for unified pairs, one youth with intellectual disabilities paired with one without. This is an, an, an ambitious and challenging in, initiative with significant positive disruptive potential. It is our hope that unified sports and unified schools will help tra transform landscapes of marginalization into landscapes of acceptance and inclusion at the global level. As Dr. Shriver shared with the President of the Greek Republic during our visit yesterday, we are the ones who should be thankful to the young athletes with intellectual disabilities for their bravery and for their participation to programs that effectively help us all be better persons, especially during times as these we are in now, where there are many complex challenges all around us. Please welcome Dr. Shriver. If I cannot win, let me be brave the attempt. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's, that's the best video we have in our whole organization. That's, uh, thank, so thank you to the foundation and the team who put that together. Wonderful introduction. It's already <clears throat> an image has covered almost everything I want to say. So I can be brief in welcoming you and thanking Andreas uh, for your kind words, for your very, I think, visionary sense of what is possible when we empower people who are in some ways uh, have been disrupted historically. Uh, I want to thank, of course, uh, Ambassador Kodelas, who leads our work here in Greece, who is here with us throughout, uh, throughout the Greek Republic. Um, Ambassador Cascarelis, who has uh, become our new best friend. I don't know where he's seated, but he's uh, uh, been a tremendous ally of ours. I want to thank Brina Maxino, who's come all the way from the Philippines, one of our lead. Brina, would you stand even now? I know you're going to get to hear from Brina. Uh, and I think there are some athletes from Special Olympics Hellas here. I'm not sure, but if they're here, are there any athletes here? No? No? I don't see any. Okay. Well, hopefully you'll get to meet some uh, sometime soon. I want to thank my colleagues from Special Olympics International, David Evangelista, who leads Europe, and Sean Ferguson, who leads our government affairs work all over the world. Uh, all of you for coming this morning on a gorgeous uh, Athenian Saturday morning, and here you are in this hall giving me the, the, uh, the, the generosity of your time and attention for a few minutes. Let me, uh, let me begin by saying uh, that I think uh, we're living in an obviously in an extraordinarily difficult times. I stand here as an American. I know many of you are Americans. Uh, no one has to tell uh, anyone watching the news how extraordinarily um, tense and uncomfortable uh, and pained uh, we are in the United States uh, on, at the end of this particular week where we have seen these images, uh, almost can't even describe them, the pain, the absolute horror of governments 
engaged in practices that we would have thought uh, inhumane, even if hidden in the shadows, much less written on the law. Uh, to me, uh, the biggest challenge of our time, and I'll try to articulate this in just a few different uh, ways today, uh, the biggest challenge of our time is to find ways to be inclusive, to find ways to break down the barriers of fear, to find ways to recognize in one another our common humanity. It sounds like a grandiose challenge, uh, but we have given our lives, our professional attention, our dedicated listening hearts uh, to this question, uh, how to do this. Can it be done practically? Can we go beyond the language of rhetoric and the language of admonition and the language uh, of high ideals and actually craft structures, craft experiences, craft programs, craft sustainable communities that put to work the idea of inclusion so that we can craft communities of inclusion and, in fact, a unified generation? Uh, the times, though, we've heard all day yesterday, I was in several of the presentations, the volatility, the uncertainty, the complexity, the ambiguity of our times. We live uh, in, in times where all of this has a toll, skyrocketing uh, rates of depression and anxiety. In some measures, uh, over 50 percent of some, young, uh, some, some demographics of young people uh, reporting overwhelming anxiety, uh, clinical levels of depression. Uh, loneliness, lack of belonging, lack of purpose, lack of connection, disengagement from school in countries around the world. Uh, in some ways, I think we're looking at a period where uh, we have created a, a wildly ambitious idea of individualism, but we have found ourselves so very much alone. Is it technology? Uh, is it the fast rate of change? Is it global inequality? Is it economic problems? There are probably elements of all this. In our population, though, we like to recognize that there's a fundamental and simple component to all of this. This is a picture of the Special Olympics World Games opening ceremonies in 1995. Down on the field, you have about 6,000 people with intellectual disabilities representing the best of their nations. About 130 nations gathered there. They have sent their best, their brightest, their strongest, their fiercest, the athletes of Special Olympics, to gather on this stadium, 80,000 fans watching. And in those days, the President of the United States attending the games, he's delivering his speech when this picture was taken. But he had to do it at the top of the stadium for security reasons. So down on the field, all the athletes had cameras, the, the old kind that we used to buy up at the, the Acropolis, you know, the the little ones, the, the yellow ones. And they're down taking pictures of one another, and there's a professional photographer like this young lady here, and he's volunteered his time. He's watching all the athletes. They're looking at the president. He sees a group of athletes. They're all getting a picture. They're from a developing country. He sees beautiful African outfits, and he sees, but they've all got the cameras uh, facing backwards. They're all, the cameras are on their noses. The lens is pointing the wrong direction. He realizes they have intellectual challenges. They come from a developing country. They've never used a camera. So he goes over to help them. He explains in English, gesticulating, not knowing if they speak English. You have to turn the camera around, then you look through, and then you push the button. And the athlete says to him, oh, oh, he says, thank you so much. He says, but if you look through the viewfinder backwards, it works like binoculars, and you can see the president at the top of the stadium perfectly clearly. Now, I love that story uh, because I think it reminds me how frequently we get each other wrong. The photographer was a good guy, meant well, uh, but he saw through uh, a filter. His filter was an assumption. His assumption led to a conclusion. His conclusion was inevitably that there was something wrong. He didn't see creativity or mischief or ingenuity. He didn't see an innovative group of uh, young people coming up with an uh, unusually uh, creative solution. He saw disability. We judge books by their covers. As human beings, we do it to one another and families. We do it amongst our friends. We do it across the sidewalk or across a room like this. We heard about it yesterday, judgments perceptions, assumptions. With our population, people with intellectual disabilities, this has a very, very, very violent, uh, 
history. The judgment of people as a function of their condition, as a function of one dimension of their identity, not of their whole identity, of one dimension of their identity. Uh, pictures like this you can find by the thousands. This is the state of about 150 years of our collective judgment braided on a single premise in country after country putting people with intellectual differences behind concrete walls and barbed wire fences in inhumane conditions. Why? Because they were just too different to belong. Too broken to matter. Too hopeless to have value. We didn't do this by accident. We did this on purpose, with intent, with a conviction that only some, only a few, could actually add value to the world, and the rest we had to rid ourselves of. In that world, and I won't belabor it, but I want to bring it up in our hearts, because at some level this grinding judgmentalism, this lack of clarity about who we are as human beings, is something we still have to struggle with. So in the Special Olympics movement in 1968, when these pictures could have been taken in almost any state in the United States and in probably three, uh, 30 or 40 different countries around the world, uh, the Special Olympics movement was born actually almost 50 years ago from right now, July of 1968. In the middle of all the violence and tumult of that year, we begin to see a new kind of picture. Here's Ajara Silla, 12 years old, Cote d'Ivoire. She has given her all to her race. She was, has been selected, has come from some corner of the world which no one suspected she would ever win anything, travel anywhere, gain any attention, and here you have her moment, her seventh place finish. And how many of us uh, can recognize in one another the joy and unadulterated uh, pride that comes from giving your all and coming in seventh? Almost none of us. Almost none of us have pictures on the wall of when we came in seventh. Almost none of us send pictures to our children or our grandchildren or get pictures from our husbands or wives or brothers or sisters. I came in seventh. But Ajara understands the difference between measuring yourself by the standards of someone else, by the standards of who you beat, and measuring herself by the standards of doing your best, of bravery in the attempt. Our athletes say at every single event, let me win. This is their oath, let me win. But if I cannot win, let me be brave in the attempt. And they mean it, and Ajara proves it. From that first event in 1968, uh, we now, as Andreas said, have 110,000 sporting events around the world. Some of them look like this. This is last weekend in Ireland. You could see this picture being taken uh, in tens of thousands of communities around the world on almost any given day, here in Greece, of course, but in so many countries around the world. Uh, this is a picture of a, of a six-year-old in her early competition, our young athletes competition, developing her body, using the state-of-the-art ideas around early childhood development to give her the best chance to prove her value to the world. But alas, the problems remain. Uh, this is the picture of a nine-year-old boy with intellectual disabilities taken just uh, uh, a year ago, Malachi, and if you can look closely, you can see that he is uh, tied to a chain. Mother, every morning, putting the lock on the chain, clasping it shut so that he wouldn't be out, so that he wouldn't be seen, so that no one would know. Uh, the shame, the humiliation would be too much. A sense of isolation overwhelming to chain your own child uh, as the only option given to you by the culture in which you live. Those eyes that we use to see Ajara in the scene before, those eyes that uh, guided by sport to see that we can play together, the eyes of compassion that guide us to see we can care about each other, the eyes, I dare say, of love that lead us to see that there is no other, 
gone, closed, shut out. We, I like to say, uh, this is a symbol of the biggest challenge facing the world today. It is the attitudes of mass destruction. It is the attitude of fear. The difference is so uh, corrosive that you cannot, I cannot get along with you. You are too different to fit. You are too broken to have value. You are too flawed to belong where I belong. I have to keep you out. And the wages of this attitude on our population are horrific. Day in and day out, ridicule and, uh, and mockery and humiliation. Day in and day out, parents having to fight. Day in and day out, schools saying no. Day in and day out, employers saying no. Day in and day out, community saying, not in our community. Not them. Too different. Damaging. Flawed. Defective. So we, uh, we believe that this uh, is the issue of our time. And we don't just believe that attitudes of mass destruction uh, are something we want to talk about. We believe that our athletes, as Andrea said, are not just the victims of these attitudes, but also the secret key to changing them. Also the link to figuring out how we can teach belonging and the beauty of each person comes not from us to them, but from them, in effect, to us. So <clears throat> we want to move, Andreas mentioned this, we want to move from an era where the Special Olympics movement is seen as something that takes place next weekend or next month or next year. When's the next one, people will say to me. I say, right now. Uh, but to make that come to life, we want to move into schools all over the world. Not so much to offer an opportunity for students with intellectual challenges and differences, but to teach lessons from them. Not so much to unlock their gifts and create a situation where they feel the pride of achievement, but to allow them to unlock our gifts so that we can feel the joy of belonging the erasing of the lines of difference, the opening of even our own vulnerability, the lack of needing to hide any longer. So we've launched this program. I won't go into a lot of details. It has, though, three key pieces, and it's worth noting these pieces because the first is that young people themselves will lead this. And we have in our midst, I believe, the millennials and centennials. We moan a lot about them. But they are open-minded, they are creative, they are entrepreneurial, they are accepting, and they are tolerant. And we believe that they will, if we give them the challenge, create within their schools the end of the bullying and humiliation that so uh, destroys lives. And we believe, second, that if we use the tools, the, the teachability of sport, where we get out of our heads and into our bodies, we play together. How many people have played together in the last week? We get suits on and our hair gets a little gray and all of a sudden we realize it's no, 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 we don't want to play anymore. Wrong! Uh, play is the great teacher, the first teacher, the means by which humans begin their learning experience. We play even in the earliest days of infancy. We need to return play to the center of the teaching experience and then invite the lessons of play to the whole school. So you say to me, is this possible? The answer is a definitive yes. Uh, these are pictures of schools uh, in, in different parts of the world, assemblies, gatherings, where young people have said, let's have a celebration of the spirit of inclusion. I especially like that picture in the upper left-hand corner, unity. Just a couple of teenagers sitting around, having a great day, out on the field, with their friends, holding up a sign, identifying and naming their agenda. Unity. It's also a verb, to unify. Unity isn't just a noun in our world. Unifying is uh, an action. So I want to give you a short video of one of these schools. Watch it closely. It's homemade. It's not polished. It's not prepared by a big uh, uh, advertising agency. Uh, it's made by the sco a school in Rhode Island. It's the story of two brothers. 
and their impact on the school. Watch, if you, if you will, closely, not just the voices you hear and the faces you hear talking, but the other faces of the young people in a school that we call a unified champion school. If we could show this video. Pivot? Penguin? Patriots. Pivot. Patriots, there we go. Yeah. Jason loves sports. <laughs> Jay loves the Patriots. Who, who you like? <laughs> Gronk? Ah, Say it. It's Gronk. Gronk. Everyone's curious, like, living with a person with, like, disabilities, like, how daily life is, and it's like, I don't know, just it's normal. You good? All right. Have a good day. Be a good boy, right? I am. I know you are. It's like a normal brother relationship. We fight a lot. And we also have great moments together. It's, it's great. It's life. You know, I think that when you talk about Evan and Jay, you talk about, you know, they're really one person here. It's not Evan, it's not Jay, it's Evan and Jay. Jay's just like a big ball of joy. A student who typically you wouldn't hear much communication from, but when you do hear it from him, you feel it. He greets you in the morning when you walk in. He wants to get up and make sure everybody's smiling and having a good time. So he may go by you, tap you on the shoulder, he may make a silly face. Who's on your basketball team? Evan. Evan. Who's he again? My brother? I'm a brother. My brother. Evan and Jerry instrumental in our inclusion movement. Um, Evan Hallberg alone is the dream for a teacher. Programs like TOPS, Special Olympics, and most recently Unified Sports have provided a foundation for individuals of all abilities to express themselves and succeed in society. You don't really know until you're up there and that your heart's pounding knowing that you have to like give this page and a half long speech in front of everyone. I know that when I graduate from high school, I will miss the times I've spent with my brother. Even the little things, like car rides at school, with the radio booming and him dancing in the back seat. I started like sobbing a little bit, and then Jay put his arm around me, and then after that I knew I was kind of like done. But I, I remember that I'm talking in front of the entire school and I'm on TV, so I had to keep going. Making a contribution to a huge movement is the biggest thing anyone can really do. It feels, it feels humbling. For this is why I choose to include. Thank you. Oh my God. <laughs> Through sports like Unified, I can trust everyone to protect my brother because they know that he's no different than anyone else. Perfect. <laughs> like no greater joy yeah so I don't know if you could uh, if you could see some of those faces if you can hear again that last line it's a young teenager talking about his brother, talking about being able to trust the world to accept, to look after, to keep his brother safe. Isn't that what we want for our brothers, our sisters, our kids? We want to be able to trust the world. Trust the world with the things we love. Trust the world with our own hearts that are tender and vulnerable. And what does it bring, as he says, wise beyond his years, no greater joy no greater joy. So this is uh, this, this particular school, they've rewritten their, their school uh, motto. They've redesigned their school pledge and uh, 
if, well, I do have enough time. I'm just going to go over by one minute. Uh, so this is the new motto of Ponegansett High School, and we're going to see this in thousands of schools, Andreas, and, and even more than the number we committed to, and I promise you that. As a member of my school, imagine this is your, your place of business when you go to work on Monday. I pledge in my place of business to look for the lonely, the isolated, the left out, the challenged, and the bullied. It doesn't say I pledge to accept them. It doesn't say I pledge to welcome. I pledge to look for. I will go out of my way when we get to coffee. Do you pledge to go out of your way to see if there's someone in our gathering uh, who is not yet uh, feeling included. I pledge to overcome the fear of difference. These are, these are teenagers talking. It, they could have said, I mean, I would have, if, if they'd asked me, I said I would have overcome ma attitudes of mass destruction. I, I pledge to overcome the fear of difference and replace it with the power of inclusion. And every kid that comes to this school has to sign. Well, it doesn't have to, but they invite to sign, to put their handprint on, to sign their name to. I pledge to, I, I, I choose to include. The t-shirts say I choose to include, the windows in the school, the halls, the classrooms, I choose to include. What a difference. Does it detract from academic achievement? Heck no, people are achieving at higher rates. Does it detract from focus on high achievement and sports? Heck no, they're even more empowered to want to achieve. And so these are the models that we can look at. And, 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 and it's not just in schools. Uh, you know, when, when you come to a Special Olympics, a global event, which I hope some of you will do, and maybe some of you have done, maybe some of you were here in Athens in 2011, Iran and Iraq and Israel march in together, the eyes. And before you know it, you've got friends. They're not talking about uh, political, uh, angry, divisive issues. They're talking about common ground, taking pictures, sending selfies home. Uh, as though we were one human family. Wow! What a shocking conclusion. No one seems to be able to draw it except these athletes. So this is our commitment. And uh, some of you, will, if you, if you, were, if you were with me earlier, you saw the picture of Malachi. Guess what happens when you have people who choose to include? Within three days of that picture of Malachi being taken, volunteers were on their way to that refugee camp in western Tanzania. Volunteers now in Tanzania one of the poorest countries on earth, volunteers who within a, a few months organized the first Special Olympics event in the camp. And look at how they lined the field. Somebody went and got a chalk. Who knows where they got that chalk? I have no idea. And they lined the field so they could have races. And wouldn't you know that little Malachi got to race. There he is on the left, and you, there he is on the right, the same boy. literally freed from his chains, literally entering into the world where every gift is accepted, where this alternate premise is invited to be the norm. Everybody has a gift and everybody belongs. So I don't have time for that, but I will close with, uh, with the lines that were shared at the royal wedding. I don't know how many of you watch, uh, watched the, uh, the beautiful wedding ceremony a few weeks ago. Uh, but the minister there chose to use the words of the great uh, Jesuit paleontologist Teilhard de Chardin, uh, who wrote in the middle of the 20th century, uh, in the midst of so much tension and violence, he himself uh, uh, a witness to World War I, uh, that we really have one big challenge. Uh, we've got AI, we talked a lot about it yesterday, but do we have EI? Do we have love intelligence? He's inviting us to recognize the centrality of love intelligence. We can master every element of the physical universe. But someday, we will turn our focus uh, to the energies of love. Uh, my friends, Andreas, to you and your team, we are focused on trying to harness uh, for God the energies of love. It's just that straight a line between Brina and her fellow athletes around the world and what we believe to be the most important issue of our time. And I thank all of you for being interested in enough to listen and hopefully uh, committed enough uh, to join us as we try to embark on this adventure of teaching uh, the experiences of inclusion and love
to young people all over the world so that they will become the first generation in our history that can honestly say they are a unified generation. Thank you very much. Thank you for these inspiring words. And now I would like to ask to the, to the stage the next panel, Disrupting the Disruption. Well, welcome everyone uh, in attending this panel. As Dr. Shriver said, this is a beautiful uh, Greek Saturday morning. So thank you all for being here to share with us the experiences of all these remarkable people that we have on the panel. Uh, do not forget that you can submit your questions at, uh, through the link snf.org slash conferences. And should any of you find it difficult to type in a question, there will be people uh, walking around with microphones so that you can ask your question if, if you need to. So without further ado, uh, I would like to invite Brina to share with us some of her experiences. She came here from a long way, and we are very, very, very happy to have her. So Brina, the podium is there ready for you to give your speech. Hello, everyone. Good morning. I am Bina K. Maxino from the Philippines. I am a person with intellectual disability because I have Down syndrome. Down syndrome causes many medical problems that delay our physical and mental development. When I was nine days old, our doctor told my parents that I might not live long because I had a hole in my heart and very poor muscle tone. With God's grace, I am now 21 years old. When I was 10 years old, a psychologist said that I had borderline IQ and that I might not even finished grade school. I exceeded her expectations. At 16 years old, I graduated from a regular high school as class valedictorian. At 20 years old, I graduated from college with a degree in KB history. Today, I work as a preschool assistant teacher. I studied in regular kids 
I studied in regular schools because I was slower than a regular kids. I had to work harder. It, it is sad that some people do not see our hard work. Instead, they only see our disabilities. Some classmates bullied me because I was not like them. They called me ugly and stupid. They excluded me from the games because I was too slow. There were schools that did not accept me because I was not smart enough. Every day, persons with intellectual disability suffer rejection and ridicule because some people think that we, that we are not good enough. They are wrong. We can do more and be more. If only the world would give us the fighting chance. I am what I am today because of a strong support system. First, because of my parents and my family who love me unconditionally. Second, because of my therapist, doctors, teachers, and tutors who provided excellent care for my special needs. Third, because of the inclusive schools that accepted me and encouraged me to do my best. And fourth, because of Special Olympics that told me to focus on my strengths and to fight for the respect and inclusion of people with intellectual disabilities. I am happy to be in Greece. The land of heroes. As I salute the great heroes of Special Olympics, you have earned for us the right to play, to study, to work, and to live side by side with the rest of, with the, rest of the world. In behalf of the five million Special Olympics athletes around the world, I think the Stavios, New York Coast Foundation, for believing in us and supporting the cause of Special Olympics. I appeal to all people with good hearts. Please help us spread the message of love, acceptance, respect, and inclusion. Please be the next heroes who will stop the bullying, rejection, and ridicule of people with intellectual disabilities. As a unified generation, let us stand together and declare that all people matter. We who are differently able, we matter too. Thank you for listening and God bless us all. Well, Brina, that was great. Thank you very much. In one part in your speech, you mentioned uh, how the difficulties you had at school. What were the challenges that you had to face? It's ready. Let's take some partners. Thank you. Uh, um, okay. Yeah, I see it. Okay. Uh, Thank you for the question, panels, and I'd like to be here with the rest of the panelists and David also, the great man. And the question is nice, and my answer is, why is my, what is my experience of bullying? Um, at first, um, 
I was one of the guys, and then they, they post me, and then I post them back, and then I call them jerks, dozers, or monkeys. And um, they call me ugly at first, and they always just took my studies. Um, they call me ugly and stupid, and I will stop them by pushing them away. How did you feel when this happened? Um, since school, I guess. Um, they called me fat because I just ate chocolates. Um, because, um, that's when I was in playing in the playground. They always bullied me at that time. And, but you were a better student than them. I am. Did, did they pass all their exams? That's me, and them. <laughs> so you passed your exams, but they didn't? Actually, I got a, a rate of uh, 97.7. Highest average in school. Excellent. Perfect. So they, they, they called you ugly, they called you fat, but you pushed them away, and you said that you're not going to have any of that. So you showed strength. Good for you. <laughs> And in Special Olympics, what, what sport do you do? My sport? That's a good question, Panos, but I will answer your question. Actually, I played in my school sports, my sports first instead. I play um, tug of war instead. And I play, the first I discovered was people who know was basketball. Popular sport. I played once, but I'm out of balance. I tried to shoot the ball in a basket, so I tried to shoot. So that's not my one of my favorite sport. Secondly, um, when I went to the field, I tried soccer, David, and it's very hard to kick with my feet. It's very hard to manage, so that's not my favorite sport. My sport is now is bowling. I discovered bowling now. Not even basketball or soccer. And I try volleyball instead. It's very hard to manage my hands. So I have a training, se a training session with my coach. And that's why I discovered Special Olympics. Don't worry about football. I try to play football, but I can't kick the ball either. So <laughs> it's, it's a tough time when I try. Uh, David, how, how did your relationship uh, develop with Brina? And, you know, what is, what is the reciprocal relationship between Brina and Special Olympics now? I, I think, well, first off, thank you, Panos. And, and uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to share the stage with so many distinguished guests and to everyone here. Um, I think in many ways, Special Olympics began as a movement uh, for a population very much in need, for a population uh, that, that was and, and remains, regrettably, uh, probably the most marginalized worldwide. Uh, I think Dr. Shriver's presentation highlighted the, the advancements uh, that, that the world has made, I think, through the vision of our movement. But after 50 years, it's clear that Special Olympics has now become a movement from uh, people with intellectual disabilities. Brina is now bringing her message of love, literally, uh, to the world. Um, and I think through that, what we're finding is that Special Olympics um, started as a sports program, is in its heart, in its essence, a sports program, uh, but it's a metaphor. Uh, it's it's a, a movement of encounter. It's, it's a movement of revelation. Uh, what we thought we were helping to bring out of others, we find being brought out of ourselves. and. Uh, so the reciprocal relationship is really Brina empowers us to, uh, to do more, uh, think better, uh, and challenge the world to redefine what ability is. And rather than trying to be the best, uh, I think what we find in all of us is that if we do our best uh, in a collective way, uh, the world moves, uh, let's say, better and differently. Dr. Koplovic, Brina talked about the importance of doing sport and how she, how she was strong in her school and she achieved so much. 
what, you know, Brina talked about sport, what, what really makes a kid happy? And, you know, philanthropy tries to support activities that make people happy. Are they overstated? I mean, is it too much? So I would think that if you, you speak to people who have uh, children who have intellectual disabilities or children who have a mental health disorder or a learning disability, um, they can feel very demoralized, not depressed, but demoralized by the fact that they feel rejection, they feel failure in everyday activities. School in itself can be um, exceptionally demoralizing if you have dyslexia and you're going to have to read out loud, or if you can't sit still and pay attention, or if you're too afraid to go to school. And every one of those parents will tell you that by finding a passion for their child, by finding something that makes their child feel good, uh, is the message that they have to get. Uh, once a year in May, the Child Mind Institute actually has a campaign where we ask famous people who have struggled with a mental health or a learning disorder to provide us with a childhood photo and a 30 to 60 second uh, video of what they would tell their younger self while they were suffering from depression, anxiety, dyslexia, um, uh, Asperger's, and inevitably they talk about a mother or a father or a teacher who said, you are special. There is something that is unique about you and you're great at poetry or you're great at piano or you're terrific at drawing. And so I think where we as individuals who care about the rest of society is to find that special talent that each person has and make them at least feel good about that so that they feel success even though other things in life can be very challenging. Commissioner Sutton, children are very different from veterans, but what Dr. Kopolovic said strikes me that it might be something that you, you see in the cases of veterans that you engage very frequently. Would you like to share that with Absolutely. Line? As I listened to Brina talk, and, and I was reminded of the spirit that athletes and veterans share. And yet so many times that spirit can be dampened, sometimes with the best of intentions. With veterans, it can happen with society looking at veterans and putting in them into one of two categories. Either they're superhumans, superheroes to be worshipped, or they're, they're victims to be pitied. And so I've spent the better part of my life immersed in this challenge of figuring out within this disruption of war, how to get to the disruption of this disruption, which is the human spirit, and to connect with veterans at that level, which is why, as important as clinical treatment is, that I'm a psychiatrist and, and, and absolutely value that, but we've had to listen to our veterans and their family members and understand that after 16, 17 years of war since 9-11, half of our veterans won't go to the hospital or clinic. We've got to move the front line of hope and healing and intervention from the clinic to the community, which is why what we're doing in New York City now is to embed our efforts in culture, education and the arts. Some of you saw Brian Dorries and his Theater of War the other day. We want to make a bold statement that when it comes to becoming whole again, whether it be from war, whether it be from making the most of one's disability, it's about connecting to the shared humanity that connects us all. Peer-to-peer -peer relationships, holistic services, things like equine therapy, yoga, acupuncture, that make us feel more normal, more human. And if clinical treatment is needed, of course, you're not alone, you've got your buddy. And so it's turning the conventional paradigm sort of on its head and leading with inclusion, leading with community, with hope, with love, and our shared, our shared humanity. Stelio, I saw you nodding while Commissioner Sutton was speaking. As a psychiatrist in Greece, uh, if, well, you know, funds come difficultly. If you had a choice to have funds for clinical treatment 
or funds to do cultural programs, extracurricular programs with your patients in, in psychiatry? Which, which of the two you would use? Well, this is a very difficult question because, you know, research has shown that uh, even when somebody suffers from a mental disorder, this person should come back to become fully functional as soon as possible. Um, this person should uh, come back to the state he or she was uh, before uh, having the disease. So, as Commissioner Sutton said, uh, these people need medical treatment. However, the period after that is very important as well. How do we include these people in society? How do we bring them back to their normal lives, which is very important as well? So I think that if I had uh, this amount of money that you proposed, uh, if I had this funding, well, I would invest it in uh, social approaches. First of all, I would like to raise awareness, inform society, tell them that uh, people who suffer are not uh, the pathologies of the society. Each one of us have something maybe cancer, maybe heart disease, maybe a mental disease. So we should understand that people suffering from a disease are not dangerous. They are part of our society. They are, let's say, a will in this uh, cart of society. And uh, this is what humans are. We have many organs, we have many disorders we suffer from. We cannot be perfect. This is something that we should accept as part of our daily lives. I was on Facebook the other day and I saw this picture you put up with your dad, right? So it just made me think that you're a very elaborate person, you say very successful, uh, what you said is great, but and the importance of uh, society is great in what you speak, but doesn't it all start from the family? I mean, you know, every time I see you, I'm with your dad. Actually, in Greek, there it says that he's a difficult person. I, I never thought you were a difficult person. You're a very nice person. Uh, but, you know, what's the importance of family in, in dealing with all these things? Um, well, this brings us to a whole different part. What happens actually when uh, someone who um, is sick is also a person with a disability? So unfortunately, the world and society in general have not yet accepted the identity of disability. And as uh, Brina put it quite correctly, we have have forgotten how to stand next to each other. And in particular, in the Greek society, the support uh, for a person with disabilities is its family. These are the persons who make a decision as to whether they are going to be supporting the person with disability or not in order for this person to be a citizen in the society where this person was born. I was lucky enough and I had the pleasure to have two excellent, magnificent parents who allowed me to be included in society in a very normal way. Since when I was born, I didn't have a choice. Um, without them, I might have been someone who would be deprived of the knowledge of life. Maybe I would be living in an institution. Parents also become supporters of people with disabilities. And there you have the 
relationships uh, conflict. Uh, the thing is, what happens afterwards, as soon as parents are no longer there? And in Greece, this is a very blight picture. There is no support. There is no organized situation that allows us to support the life we want to lead. I'm a psychiatrist myself, and I am someone who wants to offer to society. As you greatly mentioned in uh, the uh, video, it is not about what the country does for you, but rather what you do for your country. So this is what I would like to do, to be offering to this country to the best of my abilities. However, this country has to be able to support people with disabilities, with personal aids, personal assistance. Uh, this is a service that is completely lacking in Greece. So to me, uh, the future is full of fear since I'm a psychiatrist myself. A uh, tremendous amount of funding. I think we have to do a few things to disrupt the disruption. Number one, we have underfunded um, brain science for child mental health and developmental disabilities. And without a revolution in, in research, we keep the status quo. And number two, we do not have enough providers. So the most common illnesses of childhood um, under the 18 and under are mental health and learning disorders and developmental disorders. So you have, in the United States alone, you have over 17 million children who suffer from one of these disorders versus 200,000 who have diabetes and 11,500 who have cancer. And the amount of money that goes for cancer research or for diabetes research or for asthma, which seven million kids have, uh, is staggering compared to the quiet um, and I think the silent suffering of these kids who have mental health disorders. And it's because there is stigma. Uh, it takes on average two years from the onset of these uh, disorders onset before parents take kids to see someone. I think it's a lack of services being available, a lack of effective treatment. And this is, in my opinion, uh, an epidemic that is worldwide. So, uh, for instance, um, the leading cause of death for 15 to 19-year-old girls in the world, according to the World Health Organization, is suicide. And the fact that that exists and we don't take a, a global uh, movement to correct that tomorrow I think speaks to the fact that because we don't see it, because we don't invest enough in brain science, uh, that occurs. And I agree that once we identify someone who has one of these disorders and we give them the treatment, they certainly should be an active and full member of society. But if we don't identify it early, um, we really we, we change the trajectory of someone's life. We don't give them the full potential that they could reach. So, so, so how do we identify them and how can we manage, manage them? So I, I think that one of the most important things is education at an early, early age for the public. So the fact that we all learn about diabetes in school and we learn about blood pressure and we learn about exercise, we should learn about brain health as well. So that if there's a greater chance that I'm going to get ADHD or depression or anxiety, then I'm going to get diabetes or cancer, I certainly should be learning about that when I'm in elementary school and middle school and in high school. I think also the idea that we screen for certain illnesses and we don't screen for intellectual functioning, we don't screen for mental health as routinely as we should in public schools across the world. Because the good news is most of these disorders respond to intervention. Um, you know, you don't get children or young women like Brina unless you give them opportunity, unless you give them exactly what she said, a great school, terrific doctors, caring parents, that's how you get full potential. A and Special Olympics, clearly, you know, other opportunities. And the same thing would go for kids with mental health disorders. If you give them the right opportunity and the right kind of accommodations, they can thrive. But I think it starts from the public understanding how real, common, and treatable these disorders are and having the resources so that uh, health care is being able to be provided the same way that we provided for you know, measles, mumps, and rubella or for you know, pneumonia or for a virus. Throughout the years, a man moves on a biopsychosocial model. And throughout these years, 
as long as there is research and uh, the science of uh, identifying what man is all about, we have invested on that first part, the biological element of science. However, we have forgotten how this psychological constituent of man is developed. What is what we call psychology and even more so, we have um, neglected this great factor of society and how society influences individuals. We have uh, proceeded to an uh, homogenization of uh, man. It's as if all people are the same. If we consider Finland's uh, system in education, we'll see that they have made great progress because they have customized their education in order to showcase and promote people's skills. Uh, the individuals of um, the individual properties and skills of each person. We need to uh, adopt a different approach and see how society affects individuals uh, and this might change the way we conceive and perceive man talked about uh, difference and how recognizing difference is important um, uh, what's your take on that you know here we, we by the way we use a lot of terms in this panel and we use them lightly but we use them disability difference impairment illness they're all kind of different so you know, how through the prism of Special Olympics and your experience do you, do you approach Telios's point? Well, I, <clears throat> I think in large part what we see in the world today, and it's not just a, a, a modern phenomenon, but um, where we're encouraged and we're, re we're rewarded in this world for being right. Uh, everyone wants to be right. We don't celebrate being wrong. Being wrong is bad, negative. Um, but Dr. Shriver in his presentation used the, the, the example of the very well-meaning photographer on the field in New Haven, Connecticut, who was wrong. Uh, and his mind was likely his stereotypes, his understanding of what the world was, not only for people with intellectual disabilities, but his own world, was shattered. He, a, he's a professional photographer, thinking he's helping uh, 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 athletes with intellectual disabilities from Togo or Cote d'Ivoire um, and he was taught a lesson don't be so quick take the time to listen and I think in a world that is so pixelized so fast uh, you're not rewarded for being wrong I think any, unified sports is an example of getting people comfortable with being wrong and moving toward a place of comfort of together, uh, that's why we call it play unified, learn unified. Brina's teaching us things. Brina and uh, athletes of Special Olympics that have inspired me, like Kester Edwards, uh, who was my first and still my inspiration for the movement, taught me how wrong I was about jumping to conclusions about what is an intellectual disability. And so I've moved in a, in a way that uh, I don't believe, I, I, I question greatly the idea of a, of a population with special needs. My understanding is that that population is eight billion people. Eight billion people have special needs. If anyone in this room would, would deny that they, ha they don't have unique or special needs, then I would be curious to hear about that. So we need to move in, in a direction for the world to stay together in some way. Um, we need to move to a place where we can celebrate being wrong in a comfortable space of revelation and encounter uh, rather than uh, having winners and losers. And I think what Mrs. Shriver um, uh, said many years ago, I, I don't know if it was in South Bend, Indiana or one of the World Games sites, um, Special Olympics is unique in the sense that uh, you can have victory without victims. Yes. And what any, any major sport figure uh, will tell you that that is the true essence of sport, is you can win without having losers. And I think that's, if we get there, if we get there, we're going to be in a, in a much better place to understand the other issues. But David, I think you have to, I'm sorry. 
David, I th while I agree with you that everyone has special needs, I think we have to be careful about that. Because if there is a limited amount of money, if there is a limited amount of resources, we should be able to give those resources where someone has a disability that is impairing in some ways, that's causing great distress and dysfunction. And that's why they get legal accommodations, that's why they get insurance coverage. And when we, I think, minimize it by saying and recognize that every human has a special need, I don't think that every human deserves, by the way, to have that special need met the way someone else may have it because of the severity of it or the interference it's causing. And I, and I, I understand why you don't want to segregate but I'm saying, the, you know, to have success, we have to be able to identify and provide services that are essential for someone to then be part of the whole without being a second-class citizen. Sure, uh, I, I, but I think, and, and what I think you're going to is what I, I, I just met a, a professor who you may know, in fact, uh, Martin Block sure. from, from Virginia saying, um, uh, if I treat everyone the same, am I treating, am I treating everyone fairly? So I think what you're saying is sure, you know, that there's a, a spectrum of need. Uh, and of course, of course. Uh, but I think that there are plenty of special Olympic athletes that I have met in my own personal life experience uh, that uh, have, and I'll be open, <laughs> we are a movement of openness, have much less anxiety than I would feel. Uh, they have much more openness. They're much more comfortable with themselves. A lot of us wear masks. Uh, um, and so, I, absolutely, uh, in the spectrum of life, you need to dedicate resources where you can provide the maximum level of support to maximize someone's human potential. My point is more of, if we move too far in that direction, what we end up forgetting is that there's a shared humanity Correct. where there's much more residual that keeps us together than what would put us in those different categories. But to, 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 you're absolutely right uh, in the regard that um, there is a spectrum and that can't be negated. Well, and, and coming back to your uh, comment about being wrong, it seems to me that if any of us in the work that we do to day to day, if we aren't wrong, if we're not failing on a fairly regular basis, maybe we're just not stretching far enough. So if we can you know, just embrace being wrong and learn from it, uh, it seems to me that that's what the road to change, to innovation, to inclusion is paved with, is understanding that none of us has the perfect lens through which to see the world. But I come back to you, Brina, and, and your warrior spirit, and I wanted to share with you the warrior ethos. Maybe you can relate to, to this disruption of the, the warrior spirit. It goes like this. It's mission first. Your mission? Let me win. Never accept defeat. Never quit. This last one is my favorite. Never leave behind a fallen comrade. And that's as important on the battlefield of sport as it is on the battlefield of war, you know, life. Commissioner Sutton, uh, do some veterans feel left behind? And obviously your experience is mainly from the United States, but war is an experience that probably unites veterans across the world. Maybe they fought on different sides, and maybe there are things that uh, keep them apart and they will never breach. But the experience of war is, it seems to be unique to these people when you talk to them. It, it, it stigmatizes them forever. What services do they need when their service is over? And I wonder if you can kind of try to globalize your perspective mm -hmm. to include maybe countries other than the US too. Absolutely. You know, we've had the, the privilege the last couple of years in New York City to do what no other city has yet done. Under Mayor de Blasio's leadership, uh, we've stood up a, a city agency dedicated to veterans and their families. So it's in this context that we've had to ask ourselves, what's the purpose of this agency? What services do we provide? How do we measure success? Is it the number of programs? Is it the budget? Is it the number of people we've hired? And we thought about it, we thought, you know, really, our success is measured by how well we empower 
veterans and their families to keep serving. Service on behalf of others is our North Star. So by that reckoning, whether it be in employment, which you know, we, we work with, with companies and employers all the time who oftentimes with, you know, they'll jump in and they'll do, the, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll do the right thing and hire veterans, but they very quickly find out it's the smart thing to do as well. And that has a catalytic effect. Right now we have a Veterans on Campus initiative where we're shining a bright light on all of the best practices of student veterans. And we're working to upend the prevailing narrative that sees veterans as victims, as weak. Because actually all of those struggles are true. The brain injuries, the suicides, the PTSD, the burns, all of those things are true. But our veterans and their families, they didn't listen to anyone who said, you, you've got to stop doing what you want to do. They wanted to keep on jumping out of perfectly good airplanes. They wanted to, to go ahead and, and, and come back to civilian life, prepare themselves for lives of continued service. So our approach is to connect with them at the peer-to-peer -peer level, embed them in a foundation, a strength-based foundation, our version of grit, growth, resilience, integrity, and teamwork. And then if they need clinical services, which by the way, speaking of philanthropy, Arnold Fisher, the Intrepid Fallen Heroes Fund, several years ago when we had our, our sons and daughters returning with, with amputations and burn injuries, raised money from the American people to, to build and equip world's leading center for the intrepid for world-class amputee rehabilitation. A few years later, 2007 now, when the army was in shambles after the Walter Reed scandal, Mr. Fisher came to me in my new position to, as I was seeking to stand up this new center of excellence. And he said, I want to do the same thing for the unseen wounds of war. And that became our mantra. And what that has now spawned is not only this network of networks within the, the military, but now in the civilian world, bringing together professional athletes who are suffering from brain injuries with our veterans and their families. So it's an integrative, it's, a, it's, a, it's an all of the human approach, mind, body, spirit, with special attention to the moral impact of war. You said the unseen wounds of war. Uh, there are unseen wounds uh, to many of us. And I will not, not just ask about the veterans, I will ask, it's a general question, but I will ask it by using veterans as an example. What are the unseen wounds of the veterans and their families? So Stelios mentioned the importance of caregivers. What is the wound of a family that needs to be the caregiver of a veteran or a person with a mobile impairment? And are there any unseen, even physical wounds of veterans that maybe we need to start putting on our agenda as provisions of how we need to help people? Well, you know, Not out of, our... of charity, in order to help them to service. Yes. So. First order disruption of war on the individual, the family, the community, caregivers. Senator Elizabeth Dole launched just last year a hidden heroes campaign to shine a light on the needs and the strengths of caregivers and this role that is so vitally important and so enormously, profoundly difficult unless it's shared. And Senator Dole is applying the same principles of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, support and sharing and access to professional services, of course, and a sense of inclusion that, that truly we're, we're all in this together. We sent our best, our sons and daughters, to war, and now we must bring them back. And of course, with Senator Dole, she knows of what she speaks. Her husband, Senator Robert Dole, uh, World War II veteran, she's been a caregiver for a long time. She knows the strengths, the struggles, the blessings, the burdens 
of coming back with wounds, illnesses, and injuries of war. I'm, I'm interested in the fact that when you're a warrior and you see yourself as someone who's strong and uh, a fighter, and you come back with one of these unseen wounds, you know, these, the suffering of PTSD or depression, how does one, since that stigma affects children and teenagers who suffer with these disorders also, how do you tackle that? How do you get the warrior um, to accept that without treatment they can't, they can't function? You know, they're no longer on the war, they're no longer on the battlefield, they're now back at home and they're having new, uh, new challenges. You know, I, I think Sebastian Younger, some of you may be familiar with his work, uh, he captured it so well. Uh, m most recently in his book, Tribe, but also in his book, War, where two, two sergeants met each other a few years after coming back from war on the streets of New York and were saying, you know, oh, I knew what I did when I was downrange. I took care of my soldiers. I put the mission first. I didn't leave anyone behind. You know, I'm just not any good at being a civilian. And Sebastian Younger concluded his book by saying, perhaps the toughest wound is the one that makes you wish, makes you miss the war you got it in. And so there is this, this need for us to be able to just, even like we're doing today, talk about it. And talk about the things that, for example, our veterans, <laughs> I love soldiers, they don't care about our turf battles, they don't care about the philosophy, they just want to live lives of purpose, passion, and meaning. So as they came back, and wanted, you know, they wanted updated, you know, prosthetics that they could wear with shorts and be proud of. They wanted to talk about sexual uh, yes. needs and intimacy that, as medical professionals, you know, we just didn't see through that lens. But they've taught us to, to take that and, and, and relate to them as a whole person. And when it comes to this stigma, we knew that we couldn't tackle it through the lens of medical treatment. That's where the peer-to-peer -peer connection, the, the, the engagement in culture and the arts, the, the participation in holistic services and sports and all kinds of things just were so important. Because then, you know, if you need a little clinical help, what other problem on earth would be, from a warrior's perspective, if I know I've got a problem and there's a resource to fix it, why in the world wouldn't I access that? That's not going to come from me as a psychiatrist, but a buddy saying, hey, I felt your same way. I thought this stuff was crazy too, but I tried it. I have slept for the first time in months. You know, those are the ways I think that we really, the, the human face of change and courage. I'd like to make a comment and a remark. The comment has to do with the following. In 2018, we should stop talking about caregivers. Caregiving and caregiver is a passive term. I simply accept someone who helps me. I call them supporters, not caregivers, because this makes me responsible to make uh, to decide to use this service. I am characterized by society as a person with disability, so I make use of this service that allows me to be where I want and to make my dreams come true. And a second remark. I totally agree with Commissioner Saturn. Uh, it, well, what is therapy? What is treatment? What do we mean by that? So, why simply say that it's uh, medication? It is absolutely necessary for us uh, to use, of course, drugs, medication, pharmaceutical treatment, etc. But we should not only focus on uh, improving uh, the physical condition. Can we provide relief to the wounds uh, through a social framework? We need to provide services, create services to speak about the person. Um, we need to love 
people, philanthropy. This is its meaning in Greek. We are vulnerable, and this vulnerability needs to be loved and embraced because this is what man is all about. But you wanted to. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's important also, and I couldn't agree with you more, uh, Stelios. The um, uh, when I uh, many moons ago, uh, and I did this poorly, so I should I should state. Uh, but my st I did a thesis in the university on the study of eugenics. Uh, professor um, knew that I was interning at Special Olympics, and so had the great, literally the great idea of asking me to write a thesis on the study of eugenics. No idea what it was. I was a senior in university doing things that seniors at universities do. Um, and what I learned in that was uh, words matter. Words have much more power than we give them, than we, than we would think. Brina started the presentation by using some of the words that people called her and some of the words that she called them. I really like monkeys, by the way. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, mean I think, I think, so I think the disruption comes in a number of ways. Number one, I agree with you, uh, they're supporters, they're partners. Um, caregivers creates this idea of less and more, uh, rather than simply, uh, you know, it's a, a symbiotic relationship. Uh, but if you look at the last 70, 80 years, just in that time frame alone, we can see the, the great discomfort that our world has had with this population. Started with mongoloid, moved into defect. Uh, we tried to get comfortable, so we went into the mentally retarded, uh, mentally, mental disability, now we're intellectual. Can't we see that we're struggling to come to terms with something that doesn't fit in our societal dominance, which is we're all pretty much the same on the spectrum of variety. And I, but words really do matter because the words we use dictate the attitudes we keep and the attitudes we keep dictate the actions we make and those actions create the reality we live in. So I think if you look at Brina as an example, the disruption, to tie it back to this, to this theme, the disruption comes from, and this is I have to say personally and as a, uh, uh, as a member of the Special Olympics family, uh, the Stavros Niarchos Foundation is empowering not only Special Olympics but the world uh, to really flip the switch. People with intellectual disabilities are not seen as people who can advocate to themselves. But Brina just told us that she pushed her bullies away. They're not seen as the best in anything. She had a 97.7. The disruption comes when we allow that almost beautiful wrongness to reveal itself, and then we can say, well, okay, on the field of play, we can do these things in the classroom, we can do these things in our community, we can do these things, and little by little, the division that, that is killing us uh, will begin to dissipate, and we will begin to see a disruptive new model of what excellence is. And Brina, I'd like to say that you, for me, and, and many of us are exactly that model. And, and David, you know, we're talking here about revolutionary change. And I think it's important for us to acknowledge the real risks of leading change. I can only imagine uh, the disruption that Special Olympics was 50 years ago getting started. Now, having become a global movement, it's easy to lose sight of the fact there, there were tremendous risks that were taken. Uh, and, and I think the challenges that we're talking about today, I think it bears notice that for any of us leading change, it's so important for meetings like this so that we're not alone. I mean, in the, I was just going to uh, just share a quote that gives me so much comfort and courage, and it comes from Bobby Kennedy, his, his Cape Town speech titled, A Tiny Ripple of Hope. And he said, in the words of an Italian philosopher, he didn't mention it was Machiavelli, didn't want to distract the, the listeners. In the words of an Italian philosopher, there is nothing more difficult to take in hand, more perilous to execute, or more uncertain in its success than to take the lead in establishing a new order of things. That's what this is all.
Well, I think in some ways we're making, at least in the United States, we're making real progress when you look at that school in Rhode Island and you look at almost every public school in the United States now has inclusionary classes versus exclusionary. So that when I went to public school, um, there was a special ed class. And uh, years ago, I interviewed Ari Emanuel, the man who uh, merged William Morris Endeavor with uh, William Morris with Endeavor, the younger brother of Rahm Emanuel, who's the mayor of Chicago, and he grew up with dyslexia. And he said, oh, it was terrific. My mother would yell at me every day and say, you're not stupid, you have dyslexia like Albert Einstein and Leonardo da Vinci. I said, I don't know if either one of them had dyslexia. And he said, well, you go argue with my mother. But that's what she said to me. And, and, he, and he made it sound like it was really easy. But when he started talking about what school was like, he was in a class with kids who were considered the rejects, the kids who um, couldn't, uh, either couldn't communicate properly, couldn't read, couldn't think uh, conventionally enough for the classroom, and he said the only thing that saved him, in fact, was that he was an athlete. But today, that would not exist. Today, in fact, uh, the inclusion has required us to teach teachers how to have classes like that. And once they have the skills, then they're very accepting of and, and understanding the enrichment. The way that teacher said that I think Evan was a gift as a teacher, as a, a student uh, of Evan was a gift to that teacher. But that only happens once you make the change and you help the teacher with some skills that they can recognize that this is not going to be a burden, but this is going to be something that's going to enhance the entire teaching experience. When we're talking about teachers, are we talking about teachers in secondary education? Should we start talking about uh, such types of educational initiatives in university education where you know people get taught to be independent uh, in a way that might transcend uh, the level of secondary education? Is, do, do you see that as a possibility or as something that is outside of scope? I, I can say quickly, and first off, just to put the point, that's my home state, very proud, thank you very much. Um, about three weeks ago, I was in Izmir, Turkey, uh, at a unified university. At a unified university. This isn't just for school-age children, this isn't just for high school students, this is for universities as well, and I spoke to one of the faculties of physical sciences and uh, a couple of other faculties as well, and it was electric. The, the energy of, from the teachers, the, the students, of course, you, you could feel it. A younger generation, as Dr. Shriver said, they're eager, they're hungry, they're open-minded, they're not bound by the stereotypes of special education and smaller buses and not on my team. They're not bound by that. Uh, and what a liberating feeling. But in any case, in Izmir, Turkey, you had these teachers saying, give us more, tell us more, uh, uh, let us do more, because they were seeing the transformation in their own students by disrupting the dominant ideology of you can't be like the rest because you're clearly different. And that's what I was going on when saying, if we all understand the underlying special need that we all have, it, it begins to redefine how we put into practice, you know, all of those different things. So I believe that across the entire learning spectrum, uh, people with intellectual disabilities or people of all abilities have an enriching factor to offer. And uh, I think on the field of play, we bring that out very, very well. Uh, but I think, you know, Breen is a living example of how, how you can bring it out in your everyday life. So, so Brina, how did how did school and inclusion help you achieve your dreams? Uh, that's a question, Panos. Thank you. Um, at first, I didn't speak at the ones when I was a little girl. Well, I know, but I don't know, as I was Baba. And my difficulty for me is speaking. I didn't experience of my public speaking. So the answer will be how I educate myself to English schools. So that means English. I learn English for everything work and um, at first in school I was 
best student in school. I listen all my teachers and I pass all my studies when I was a little baby in Kitty Lab in the Philippines. So I did and I passed all and I went I didn't speak at once. I tried to speak a little long. I tried to read by Dr. Seuss, go, go, go. And I tried to uh, speak when I was young. So this is my first time here to panel question and answer power to panels. But here right now, um, this is my first time. My answer will be your question is, I went to a school for mainstream. I was a student since um, at, the, at the age when I was in school, I didn't speak at once. I was the shy and nervous of stage, or maybe n nervous at once in school. I didn't try English before, and it's fun learning and very inclusion for me, but education is the most important role for me to be as, uh, as a student. The most important for me, actually is the most thing in my life to be educated. So, um, when I was um, elementary, I was passed. I tell you something, when I was 16 years old, I was at top of my class when I was 40 high school as class valedictorian. And I, I never speak, I never speak too, too much. And then I was discovered by executive director at the K. Samson of Special Olympics. It's on the founder of Team Driver's Mom, Union Skin Driver. Uh, she uh, saw me as a public speaking in the Stadium Association of the Philippines. I was there and my dad, Mr. Maxino, I love him so much. He's a former president of the SAPI. So he's the one who master of all. And he's a great man. Being educated as a student um, is a message of acceptance, spread awareness, and love the people with precious with intellectual disability, what I am today right now. So I say, education is most important for disruptive, is very important role for all over the world can do be more and be more. Not even difficult. You have to, to learn to go, learn to, to love and learn to live. So it means like live unified or play unified, right? So that means that education is the most important role for people with persons with intellectual disabilities around the world. Well, it's, it's great to have you here, and it's great to have your dad as well, who is somewhere in the audience, I think. Winston? Oh, there you go. So, how... <laughs> how... Brina is a tough kid. How, how was she to... How was it for you to, 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 to be with Brina when she was young? I mean, she's a warrior. Do, do you have a microphone? Thank you. I am Winston Maxino. I am the proud father of Brina. And uh, we traveled 21 and a half hours from the Philippines to this great country. And your hospitality has never made us feel tired at all. Thank you very much. Uh, my life 
as a father of a child with intellectual disability had always been, always been spiced with sadness. Sadness because of the stereotyping, sadness because of the labels that people make on my beautiful daughter. And since she was small, I always told Brina, Brina, you are the best Down syndrome kid in the world. Why? Because I wanted her to feel empowered. I wanted her to feel that she has the courage and the confidence to do what she can do and not listen to what other people say she is. So, asking me about how I felt with Brina growing up, she was bullied a lot in school. Uh, she was not included. She was excluded from their games, from their, from their plays. She was set aside. And to us, that was already bullying. And so what did we do? We went to the school. We asked the school that we have to pull out Brina and transfer her to another regular school. But when one day she came crying, and until now I cannot help but be passionate about it and be, be sentimental about it because she came crying, telling us that her classmates called her ugly, called her stupid, called her fat, called her even a monster. At that time we thought it was never enough to just tell her to accept what people tell her to be. It was no longer enough for her to pack her things up and move her to another school. We thought that at that time, we have to teach Brina that she has to make a stand. Because I think having no stand does not make you fall for anything. And so, we taught Brina that you have to make a stand that is your right to be included and that you must force yourself through. And so, I taught her, Brina, when somebody tells you ugly, stupid, or monster, you tell him, get lost. But what did she do? She did more than that. She said, get lost, you monkeys. <laughs> But you know, there is that ensuing, uh, uh, there is that ensuing conflict of values. She's born to a family of, of Catholic family. We are practicing Catholics. We were educated in the Catholic school. But you know, we thought that this had to be done because Brina has to make a stand. Two years later, Special Olympics came to our lives. And we are so happy with what Special Olympics did. Because in Special Olympics, they do not say, Brina, we accept you, we love you, please stay aside, we don't want you to get hurt. But in Special Olympics, they say, Brina, we accept you, we love you, join us. Two years later, because of that strong conviction, Brina graduated high school. Three years later, she graduated from another course. Four years later, she, became, she, she graduated university, and now she is a teacher. So I am very thankful. I am sorry I am passionate about it as a father. And I am very thankful that Special Olympics brought this to our lives. And we are happy that Savros Nyakros actually brought this issue of inclusion and bullying into the forefront of our consciousness. Because mind you, mind you, and I say this as a father, mind you, Nyakros is not only giving impact on the five million athletes of Special Olympics, they are giving impact on the, say, 50 million 
who represent the families of these five million athletes. So thank you very much. And David, I, Panos, I did not know I have to pay for my, I thought it was free to view my child here. I didn't know you had to ask me to pay for <laughs> by answering a question. But thank you very much. Thank you. But Winston, thank you for sharing this with us. Thank you. Panos. Clearly having fathers like this make a world of difference for individual children. And I think before you said what kind of change has to occur. And I think the change that has to occur is among healthcare providers, among educators, about preconceived ideas about what our expectations are and what we think a child can produce and putting limitations on that. And the fact that a school doesn't feel obligated to protect their kids, both psychologically and physically, is unacceptable. And I think the model that we started with by seeing the video is I think the goal that we want globally that kids can be not only safe in school but can thrive no matter what their disability or their uh, disorder is with the right kind of accommodations but also the right kind of uh, professionals around them. Uh, we're almost out of time. Stelio, can I ask you a question which you can pick up with what you want to say yes. as, as a closing remark on this? Uh, Hopefully, we, we answered a, a few of the, of the items that were sent through our, our question system. But there is a particular question I'd like to raise uh, with you, Stelio, and you can take it into account. Can you talk about uh, sharing your struggles as differently abled people without positioning yourselves as subjects of charity, maintaining your agency in the narrative? I mean, you're here because you're a psychiatrist, but you're also here because you have lived the difficulty of having a mobile impairment. And the question that stems from this question as well is, can ever a person like you identify themselves as Stelios the psychiatrist and not Stelios the psychiatrist in a wheelchair? Θα ξεκινήσω πρώτα λέγοντας κάτι το I will start by saying something that touched me when I heard the Brina's father. When Brina was born, how can we tell parents that their children are sick? Can we say that the, the child is disabled because society won't take it, won't accept it? She has Down syndrome. But from that point on, this person was able to see Brina as a whole human being. So how are we to tell this person, don't love your child because your, life, your child is sick, is disabled. Set it aside. This man, as my father and as my mother, decided that we love our child simply because it's our child and we'll do what's best for it and we'll allow it to spread its wings and do what it can. So I've become a psychiatrist and unfortunately I uh, didn't know Brina in the past. I'm really glad to have met her and throughout the years I found that uh, I am Stelios, the psychiatrist, and she's Brina, the athlete. How we got here is not that important because it's as if we say well, it's, it might sound racist, but society says it, that the blondes are stupid. So how racist is that? We can say that she's a blonde woman, and one may make one's own decisions as to the kind of person they want to be. I will make my own decision as to who I want to be, and I've made up my mind. Up till now, I did have the tool with which to build. A worker without no tools is no worker. I have become a psychiatrist because I do have the tools. I have been supported by people. And what I'm afraid is that uh, sometime I won't be able to do that because there is no state support because this state did not respect 
the fact that in life we have a huge variety of individuals. Uh, it's not just those who stand on their own two feet. It's not just those who are in a wheelchair. It's not just those who have, suffer from a mental disorder or who have a, a heart disease. We're all human beings. And today, I think that this is the take-home message. We need to be reacquainted with man, starting from the basics. What is this first cell that is born in the woman's womb, it goes out in the world and it evolves. How this person evolves and creates with or without any disorder. So we need to be philanthropists and love people and provide them with all the tools necessary to do their best. Thank you all so, so much. It has been a privilege. Thank you all for your patience and sorry for taking six minutes from the time of the next panel. Thank you very much. I would also like to remind everyone Tonight we have the SNF run running into the future, and we have the fortune that athletes from Special Olympics will also be joining the race. And I would like to also welcome on stage our next panel called Disrupting Traditional Food Sources. Sculpture, painting, dance, also in food and agriculture. The production of our food, the emergence of the cultural mosaic around food and gastronomy, the artistry of food, the important role that food and food sources have played in medical advances not first, but importantly, the discovery of the vitamins. Food, of course, has been, as I'm describing, a major disruptive force in human history. Post-Columbian transfer of food ingredients along with people. Earlier than that, the sweep we now know from genetic analysis of people carrying agricultural know-how from Mesopotamia through Anatolia northern Greece, and into Europe. The continuing exchange of crop species and livestock. If you stop and think about the world we live on, though, I've only spoken so far about what happened on 30% of our globe on land. The other 70%, of course, are our oceans. And much less evident to most of us is our dependence on ocean resources. And perhaps if we 
do know about that, as I know many, of course, in this audience will, we often don't realize that when it comes to the oceans, we are still hunter-gatherers for the most part. Most part. The cultivation by humans of ocean species is a very, very tiny proportion of the total of the resource that we obtain from the ocean. Hunter-gathering, of course, is largely abandoned and was largely abandoned by human societies on Earth many, many generations ago. So you two, Lucy Best and Emily Kyan, are at a moment of disruptive, uh, emergent, disruptive, uh, um, um, possibly an inflection point. Uh, and um, so I ask you if you would to tell us briefly what FIDA is about and what your roles are in this budding enterprise. Of course. Oh. Is this, okay. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, we would like to thank the New York Ghost Foundation for hosting us and Dr. Goodman for moderating this conversation. Um, my name is Lucy Best. This is Emily Keon. Uh, we are students at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, who recently co-founded FIDA, which is a social enterprise geared at tackling climate change, food production, and human health with sustainable ocean farming. We actually have a third co-founder, um, but she was unable to join us today because she is in the midst of studying ocean farming techniques in the Faroe Islands. Um, so to give you a sense of what we're doing, FIDA, is, FIDA will grow seaweed and sell it to farmers as an alternative source of livestock feed. In addition to its nutritional benefits, seaweed-enhanced animal feed can reduce methane emissions in cattle by up to 98.9%. Additionally, seaweed production is almost twice as energy efficient as that of traditional livestock feed, and in tapping into the livestock feed market, we will be tapping into a market that is valued at $32 billion globally. The idea for FIDA came about when one of our co-founders, Eliza Harrison, went to a conference in fall 2016 where they discussed ocean farming techniques. Given that seaweed can sequester five times more carbon than any land-based plant, widespread cultivation could begin to meaningfully impact uh, the effects of climate change and restore our marine ecosystems as health. Knowing that Emily ha and I have strong environmental interests, Eliza invited us to work with her as a team to start growing seaweed close to our university in North Carolina. Since coming together as a team, we have achieved a number of successes. In September of 2017, we were recognized as finalists for the National Geographic Chasing Genius Challenge. With that competition serving as a catalyst for our initiative's rapid growth, our team has since had the opportunity to participate in a number of incubator programs, most notably one at our university called The Cube, as well as multiple pitch competitions. Recently, we traveled to Melbourne, Australia to participate in the Holt Prize competition, a competition designed, a social entrepreneurship competition designed to identify student-led ventures that have the potential to dramatically benefit global society. Our team won the regional finals, which was a development that was certainly surprising to us given that we have no formal business training. Um, and so as a result, we will be one of 40 teams who will participate in a five-week accelerator program later this summer in a castle outside of London. During the course of this intensive, we will have access to mentors whose expertise ranges from marketing to strategic planning and business. Should FIDA be recognized as one of the top teams at the end of the Accelerator program, we will travel to the United Nations and present, and there they will award a grand prize of one million US dollars to the team that has the most radical and transformative idea. Our team is deeply honored to have been invited to compete in the semifinal round of the Holt Prize, but most notably, this competition has provided an invaluable framework for us to explore larger opportunities for disruption and transformation. Founded to mitigate climate change, FIDA has grown into a captivating and exciting initiative with the potential to radically restructure a deeply damaging and unsustainable industry. In stark contrast to traditional and destructive agricultural practices, we will support the nutritional requirements of a growing global population while simultaneously avoiding challenges experienced by other innovations in the ag tech space, such as hydroponics, aquaculture, and urban gardens. By offering an alternative form of nutrition to the feedstock industry, 
FIDA will redesign international food systems such that they are more efficient, cost-effective, and environmentally friendly. In doing so, FIDA represents disruption in food, food production, economic development, and environmental systems with profound implications for the health of our fragile planet and the species that call it home. Um, so thank you again to the New Yorkers Foundation and to you, Dr. Goodman. And with that, we're really excited to have this discussion with you all and hear your questions and discuss uh, solutions to the food and climate crises. So thank you very much. Great, thank you. So you've told us about what happened in the founding of the company and the wonderful things that have happened to you and that you have done so far. I want to drill in a bit more on the two, each of you, and where, where does your inspiration to aspire come from? How, to what do you attribute your own individual um, energy of, in entrepreneurship and innovation? Could you just um, talk about that for a few minutes, please? Uh, certainly. I mean, for me, I think something that's uh, driven me in this initiative has been uh, how passionate I am about the problem, not necessarily the solution that we are providing uh, here. Um, I mean, I actually first learned about food security and its effects in a political science class of all places. Um, and one of the things that we learned about is how destructive um, climate change can be not only to the climate itself, but also to all forms of social order, um, including government and systems that are very important for supporting uh, human life and human success. Um, and so for me, so much of this drive has been about um, the passion that I have for the underlying issue and the underlying problem that we're working on. Deeper than that, Lucy. Mm -hmm. okay. um, deeper than that, because uh, I've known you just for a, a short time, mm -hmm. but I also detect something else. I detect passion for sure and I detect commitment to education and learning, but I think there's something deeper inside that drives you. Am I right? How about mom and dad? Oh, of course. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, my parents have always been an inspiration for me. They have always uh, worked very hard and shown me that uh, putting hard work into something can lead to tangible results. I would say the fact that um, I, having seen that, it definitely um, encourages me to go out and affect uh, true change. I think what's been important about this initiative in particular for me is that um, I feel like in general when I learn, as a student, when you learn about something you're interested in, you say, oh, how can I get involved in research about this or in some sort of um, pre-structured activity? But I think what's been very unique about this is it has shown me, or it's um, really directed me more towards directly solving those problems and being more of a leader in those instead of following a traditional uh, pathway for solving those issues. Emily? So I think my initial passion stemmed from growing up in South Florida. I was surrounded by the beach. I started scuba diving when I was 16. Um, and in high school, I got involved with sea turtle research, looking at fiber papillomatosis and the Everglades, and for a while I thought I wanted to do research and I wanted to do environmental research and that was my thing. Um, but in the past couple of years, I think there have been really two realizations that have spurred this transition in my career interests from scientific research to the kind of overlaps between research and social entrepreneurship. Um, and I think one of them was realizing that there's a bit of this disconnect between the scientific community and the greater population. And I think that's what's causing a lot of our issues regarding lack of education and knowledge about climate change specifically, but um, other scientific issues at large. And so I think we need more people who are there to bridge the gap between science research and communications. And also being at the two universities, UNC and Duke, that we attend, being surrounded by a community of change makers and a lot of students who are interested in social entrepreneurship as well as mentors, like this CUBE program that we did, I realized that social entrepreneurship has such a huge potential to dramatically impact global society at large, I think more so than just research does. And so I think that was really what got me motivated in trying to pursue this, not just as the research, you know, what makes seaweed so cool, what, what makes it so unique, but how can we use it in society? How can we radically expand this to really benefit people? 
Um, and so that was, I think, really what caused my motivation, but also my parents, <laughs> obviously, <laughs> and the mentors that we've had. Mm -hmm. So let's turn for a moment or two to, um, uh, to the issue uh, that drives you, the compelling issue of, of, of greenhouse gases and climate in impacts of human activity. Um, talk to us about the role of methane and what kind of a source livestock production is of methane. And then I'm going to trick you a little bit so you can begin thinking about this uh, by turning our attention briefly to the question of the future of livestock in feeding the world uh, in relation to the conversion ratios of plant food to meat and milk and how that maybe drives the livestock impetus down. Uh, so that's where I'm heading. Um, Emily, do you want to tackle that first? Sure. Let's start with the, with the effect of methane on our atmosphere. Yes. So I'm sure many of you are aware that methane is one of the leading greenhouse gases that are contributing to global warming. And one of the biggest contributors to methane gas emissions in the planet, on the planet, is the livestock industry because cows in particular produce a lot of methane gas. And so that's one of my personal favorite things about seaweed production or using seaweed as a livestock feed specifically is that depending on the species, when fed to cattle, seaweed can, can reduce methane emissions in cows from anywhere to 70 to 98%. So for the 98% number, that was a study done in Australia on a species called asparagosis. And they found that when you use just 2% of the feed as, as algae or as seaweed, all it takes, the rest is the normal wheat, corn, soy that they're using. That species of algae, once it's in the ruminant stomach, it produces a, a compound called bromoform, and that halts the methane production cycle before it gets released into the atmosphere. And so if we were to grow even other species that might not have that drastic of a result, if we were to be feeding this to all of our cattle within the livestock industry, we could drastically transform the effects of this industry and turn it to, I mean, a much more sustainable industry. I mean, that's really one of the biggest issues we see with, with cattle industry, but also a lot of the other effects that we're seeing with sustainable, unsustainable agriculture, we solve with our ocean farming, like land, resources, energy inputs, all of that. So um, what about the role of livestock in the future of human food supplies globally in a world growing to 9 billion people and beyond. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts, Lucy? Yeah, something that um, you definitely see across the world is uh, standards of living um, for many people are rising, which is a fantastic thing. Um, but with that change, there are some challenges. And one of those challenges is that as standards of living rise, people oftentimes uh, desire more animal products, more dairy, particularly more meat. Um, and so in order to fuel this demand, um, it's very necessary that we are active in pushing the livestock industry forward in a way that is sustainable. Um, and something that I think we've noticed in a lot of our conversations with farmers in North Carolina is that a lot of these systems are um, in place because that's the way it's always been done and not necessarily because it's the best way uh, possible. Um, issues deal with very complex supply chains, so it's oftentimes very important that people are doing something that will work. Um, but in order to meet this growing demand and in order to uh, feed the number of people that are going to be on our planet and give them uh, lives full of potential, um, it's very necessary that we push the livestock industry forward um, in a productive and sustainable way. So seafood, uh, sorry, seaweed cultivation, macroalgae mm -hmm. cultivation, uh, although I earlier mentioned how tiny a proportion of cultivation of ocean species is in our world food supply today, but it's actually an ancient technology. Um, seaweed has been cultivated in the Far East and, um, and, and, and used in many um, human uh, um, food sort of, um, foods and, and food preparations. Um, how do you reflect, or how do you think about something so ancient being in today's society disruptive? Briefly, because we only have a minute and a half left. <laughs> so I think something that makes 
our personal venture unique, different than what you've seen in history, is that we are specifically targeting temperate waters, and so the species we've identified thrive in temperate waters, and our model is pretty easily constructed. It's very cost-effective, cost um, and I think that could be the, the reason why you haven't seen it expand so rapidly yet, and so we're hoping that with our model, we can then tap into a lot of these coastal communities that are in developing countries and really expand because a lot of the benefits you see in seaweed um, are really suited for a community that needs these extra nutrients. Like you were saying, the protein and amino acid content, it has a similar, pro or depending on the species, but in general, it tends to have a similar protein content, content of an egg. It has all the essential amino acids. Um, and so in terms of why historically I don't think it's taken off as much as it as you think it would. I just don't think, one, potentially the environment that we're looking at is different, and two, again, playing on this social entrepreneurship idea, I don't think that the benefits have been as widely known. A lot of this, these statistics that we've been citing for you today have come about in the past couple of years. So I think it's, it's that combination of factors that set us apart and will let us move forward and really disrupt this industry. And, Expand. Lucy, would you like to have the last word? Do you <laughs> want to make a, a, a um, concluding comment? Yeah, I think something to add to what Emily is saying is also um, that uh, things can be disruptive because you, I mean, something can be very old, but you can be introducing it in a way that is disruptive. Um, so given that there is not a ton of seaweed being fed to animals as a feedstock, um, and given that uh, seaweed isn't something that is super widely used in the United States as a food source, um, Introducing it in this case can be very disruptive. And so I think you bring up a really interesting uh, issue in, or a really interesting idea in which we can uh, look to history, look to um, innovations from the 16th century, the 15th century, and uh, find new uses for them today. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention, <laughs> Lucy, Emily. Yeah. And I also want to thank the Stavros Nyakos Foundation for this event, for inviting us here, and also just to mention a landmark donation that uh, the Nyakos Foundation has given for us to work in um, Greek agriculture and food sector, directed, uh, uh, directing our work toward reducing uh, youth unemployment. You'll hear more about that program as it develops over the coming year. Uh, we do this in partnership at Rutgers with the American University, sorry, the uh, Agricultural University of Athens and the American Farm School and Thessaloniki partnerships that we really value. Thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you.